my oh, settings off. I don't know. You have so many noises. Um, well, we're live now. We'll okay. figure it out. They're just going to be noises. Hi, everybody. Uh, you're listening uh, and watching Creative Quarantine. And I'm here. I don't know. How do I? I can introduce you like you're a writer, you're a comedian. Uh, you, you literally co-created one of the most infamous shows on TV, The Daily Show. Uh, you are an activist. You are um, just, you're just amazing. Hi, Liz. Really you are. I So I know <laughs> I'm never supposed to talk about women's hair, but. When you did the the whole long hair, just it, this color on you is. You know, thank you. And I have to tell you that I had to go to four people to actually help me do it because I had all I had, I had four people tell me you're gonna look really old. I don't think you should. So I went through this horrible blonde they they go maybe you should try this. so then i'm blonde and i looked like every every asshole white lady who would call the cops on a black kid selling something on the street at a stand like all i had to do was put a phone up to my ear and go there's a child on the street who doesn't have a permit and i don't know if they belong in this neighborhood like i looked like that with this blonde hair right you look and like karen so I was like, yeah, I was every Karen. It was the worst. So I was like, no Karen for me. So then I found this woman in Minneapolis who was like, you know what? Let's just strip your hair of what's left of all this ugliness. And we're going to orchestrate gray and gray highlights and put black undertones and do it. And that was like a year and a half ago. And then my regular grew in. So I went through this whole thing and I've never been happier. I get my hair dyed twice a year. I'm just living my truth. I don't look like a Karen. It's all good. Or maybe That's a little less, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I had to see, this is actually, we have started off with the exact reason why I love you is that you are funny and honest uh, and in, incredibly, incredibly active in making sure that people get to live their truth. And that's just such an incredible space to be in, particularly as a comedian, right? So like you are our, our first comedian on the show. Uh, we are gonna have a whole week of comedians next week. Spoiler alert, uh, I'm really excited though I'm not telling anyone live right now who they're gonna be. It's going to be great. Um, we'll talk offline about it. Mm -hmm. And so, but one of the things I also love is that the thing about comedy, it, it tells the truth, right? It is, it is such a truthful place to be. And you use that comedy in your writing and how you produce things and how you organize. Um, even for you, you're now kind of, le I, I'll say leading, developing, creating uh, in two different, couple of different organizations um, yeah. that are doing some really interesting work right now. I don't think a lot of folks know um, have become hot button issues even more than they were before COVID-19. Yeah, so I, um, back, you know, it seems like forever ago, but it was, and it kind of was 10 years ago when, you know, we all watched Wendy Davis in her pink sneakers on the floor of the Texas State House uh, filibustering because Texas was trying to come through with some draconian abortion laws. And shockingly, it's just happening. Um, I felt I was back in Minnesota where I'm from and I was finishing a book that I had written. And after that happened, I was watching 27 different states pass this like model legislation, you know, it was crafted by right-wing extremists, dropped into all these state legislatures and watching clinics close really fast. And I felt paralyzed and I wanted to do something. And I was like, you know, my whole career has been sort of, can I swear here? I can't remember. Uh, there's, there's no censors and no sponsors. Okay. So, you know, shining a light on bullshit really. And so it was like, I, I, I could do that very well. And I was like, no one's talking about reproductive access and abortion and all of these monsters who are literally just holding up white supremacy and patriarchy and misogyny in a way that is relentless, right? It was relentless. So I got back to New York and I had a big dinner party with a bunch of comics and writers and filmmakers and editors and said, we have to, since the media is not gonna do this and we're people who make media, we need to sound the alarm. So I started an organization, two organizations, and one is, you know, they're both 
do the same thing. We're trying to raise awareness about what's going on with abortion access. One is a very political organization that takes on the politicians straight on, and that's called Abortion Access Force. And what we do is we hold them up, shine a mirror to them, tell people where they can go to make a difference, try to amplify other politicians. And then I have uh, an, ag an advocacy group that literally travels around the country four months out of the year where we do comedy and music shows in the hardest hit places. And then we bring on stage the providers in those towns and the activists, and we have a conversation so that our audience who loves music and comedy and cares about politics and issues can learn about what's going on in their state and then sign up right in the room to um, advocate for the clinic. So we're growing activist bases through our shows, which is really, really fun. And then, um, and then the second part of that is we go into the clinics and if they need help, we provide some kind of support. And that can be anything from bringing them meals to bringing in spa chairs so that people can get a little bit of a break during the course of their day to redoing their gardens, fixing their fences, mowing their lawns. Because if you provide abortion in these hostile states, what a lot of folks don't realize is that you can't get a care that a regular small business would get. Like you can't get services like somebody to fix your roof or if your yeah. toilet breaks or if you want somebody to a landscaper because they don't, uh, either they'll be targeted if they support the clinic or they don't believe in abortion access so they can't get the care. So for us to be able to go in and, and be able to help them do that and then bring that information to our audience, we've been able to connect all kinds of small services to the clinics. And it's amazing. I'll never forget this guy. I was, we were telling the story in Oklahoma city and the, and the clinic was saying they had a problem. So this guy raises his hand. He's like, are you telling me that activism is I get a client, I get paid and I go and I mow their lawn. And I was like, yes, you parking your van outside of that clinic is activism. And, and he could see himself and he could frame activism in a way that was connected with him. And also it's really, it's really, it's really good to ask people to simply do what they know how to do and apply it to be helpful. Sometimes it's hard to, if you're working all day and then you want to have to go to a protest and they have to go to a meeting and you have to go to this and that. And it's like, or you have a sewing machine and you can make masks for COVID or you, you know, can draw so you can do this stuff. So helping people find the ways to be helpful is, um, is, is a big part of what we do. And I think it's interesting because in the heart of that is a creative way to organize, is a creative way to outreach and do things. Um, but a lot of people, and I would be remiss not to mention this, and, and I wanna make sure that this gets said in this conversation. Um, a lot of people are asking, well, what does abortion, why is abortion access important right now? Um, because a lot of things have really been happening with statewide agendas. And I think what people don't realize, this isn't just about abortion access. This is about autonomy and it's about people having bodily autonomy and able to make choices and about politicians having an agenda that they're trying to push while people are in crisis. Um, yeah. And I think that pe like it is that it's been this relentless chipping away at, at, and making it harder and harder to access abortion, especially for poor women and women of color. Like that's, of course, every single law affects two groups of people, poor people and people of color all the time, every time it is the oppression is real, right? And so having chipped away so hard and having access to abortion be um, really hard right now and also um, difficult, um, then you add COVID onto it, right? And when you think about abortion provision in 2020, you know, so many states have doctors fly in because the doctors don't live there, right? Um, traveling now. What happens? What happens if that one doctor at your clinic has to quarantine? Thousands of patients lose work, right? What happens if your LPN or your RN or your counselors have to quarantine? There's not 50,000 counselors that you can get, right? So you forget. And also, one in four people of reproductive age will have an abortion in their lifetime. They need one. That doesn't stop because there's a pandemic, right? And so as clinics are trying to provide care, um, and doing an amazing job of social distancing and keeping people um, six feet apart in the waiting rooms. That means less patients that they can see. Um, but they're, And then when they have come up with creative ways, like um, 
you will wait in the parking lot in your car and fill out your paperwork. And then um, what one of the things our organization is doing is raising money so that we can get those restaurant buzzers for patients so that they can be in their car and they can get buzzed and they can come in and, and you can have that space, right? Um, but what's happening is you're a patient and you're in your car and everything's great. The churches that are gathering, the hateful churches, are saying, first of all, they're gathering. Second of all, they're saying, use this as an opportunity to go to the clinics in droves and approach people in their cars and minister to them as they are waiting for their appointments in their cars, blocking them from getting out of their cars, being at a distance that's unsafe, and then following them in this COVID time to their appointments. Um, and it's been an unbelievable, unbearable thing to see and watch. And as people are living in this time and we all are self-assessing of how we feel and people are feeling, you know, home insecure and food insecure and healthcare insecure and job insecure. If you find yourself with an unattended pregnancy and these governors now are trying to close down clinics the callousness to with which they can't assess a person's situation to say we're gonna we're gonna cut off um, we're gonna cut off something you might need a healthcare you might need because you're looking at your life and saying I can't possibly um, you know parent another child right now or parent a child and abortion is the right choice for me right now to have governors from around the country of which it's happening over and over where the governors are saying abortion is not essential care so we'll shut you down. Uh, it's very heartbreaking, right? And and if you want to get me rolling around, so they're they're saying that. But then these clinics that are out there that are fake, that are set up by religious people, that are solely created and funded to discourage people from having abortions. They look a lot like a clinic. You've seen advertisements, yeah. billboard, maybe you know that's like pregnant need help. It's not a real place. It's a place that is very shaming. They're yeah. allowed to stay open in Texas. Ohio and Alabama, the fake religious clinics are allowed to stay open while there's a moratorium in Texas. And yeah, it's wild. Mm -hmm. Okay. So things yeah. are going great. Things are going great. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think this on top of the fact that you do, you do a lot of your work and we were, we were actually talking about this interestingly enough, cause this is like a real truth. Like this is a real thing that needs to be said. And the funny thing is, Haha, <laughs> all puns intended, is that comedians do utilize the truth in comedy. And it, it's one of these things where it also is in my mind, like I've heard a couple of your sets before and you really do use your platform to talk about this realistic irony um, that exists. And, and, and interestingly enough, my, my biggest question right now, um, which we'll get to how people can help. I really want to make sure we get to that at the end, right before we we close up the conversation. Yeah. As you, as a comedian, as a writer, you know, how how are you seeing comedians, and how are you assessing what this means for your craft um, as a writer, as a comedian, but also as a progressive feminist? You mean this time that we're in? Yeah. Oh boy. You know, it's, I feel a lot of ways about it. And it, so I go through waves of trying to process the now and then the future. And uh, I, the questions I'm asking myself right now are, uh, well, the things I'm doing right now are I'm just going on Facebook and I'm, you know, I'm trying to be fun and funny and talk to people and be vulnerable and, and, and try to find humor in our mutual fear. I think that's a very key thing. Um, but as I look to the future, I wonder how much of the social distancing and the fear um, because we don't have leadership in place that's helping us understand that things are gonna get better and things are put in place. So yeah. in the future, this won't happen again. Um, because of that, unknown and because I don't think people feel very confident that that's happening. Mm -hmm. What does that do for people who want to, who would normally gather to go see a comedy show? Are they going to want to go back into a room full of 500 people and watch somebody on stage? Am I going to feel comfortable 
in a room full of 500 people on stage. Uh, you know, and, and so I worry about that. And I worry, I don't worry that it's gonna never happen again because I think people are gonna need to go out and gather and be social and, and connect. Um, but how long will it take? And what are we going to have to do, all of us, um, to feel safe doing that? What's the government going to have to do for us to feel safe to do that? So those are real things. And, you know, I've been doing the D nice dance parties and I've been like doing all the stuff that people are doing to try to connect. But at some point, this isn't, this is just, I need to hug someone. I need to be in a room. I need to have laughter overlap, you know? Even us talking with each other, we have to be, we can't be like, stop, wait, hold on, right? We are watching to see when it's our turn to speak. So there's a lot at stake. And I think that's, it's really interesting because we had a similar kind of question when it came to jazz clubs in our conversation with Byron Isaacs on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a real thing. And, it, and it's also... There's these utter complexities because I, I don't know a lot of folks know, but I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. One of the things that people don't know about comedians is that comedians work on a set and they work a real long time on a set. And a set may be something they work on for weeks, months, years. It may be something that they tour the entire country with that one set. And one of the things that you don't do is you do not film and you do not put that set online. It is, right. it is a really, and that is a very traditional stand-up comedy situation. And as a person who has helped do the communications for that before, like I've become very uber sensitive about, hey, can I put one joke? Can, can we not put any jokes? Like, and then understanding that set may, if, if a comedian is lucky, become a special. And then it's gone. That set is, that set is gone. It is in the world. You got to go start over from scratch. Um, if you're lucky, you get to bring one or two of those jokes with you. And I say that to say, you know, what does it now look like in a world where comedy is now all digital, where every single thing you post is now got to kind of be a new thing? And is there, do you think there's this weird demand or, or is it completely separate, right? Do you, do you feel like stand up is just going to be stand up and, and digital internet comedy is going to be digital internet comedy and sketch comedy is going to be sketch comedy? Or do you feel like there's going to have to be an adaptability until we get back to that room of 500? Uh, I definitely think there's going to be an adaptability. I am somebody who is unique. What you, the comedian that you described is 95% of comics. I am in the 5% of people who respond to the world. So I am so used to my material dying on the vine and going and, and I do it, it's done. I do it, it's done. You kind of buy into me and my outrage and my tone. If you never knew me before right now, um, I'm more like Lewis Black than I am Jerry Seinfeld, where I'm not crafting a joke till it's perfect. I yeah. am assessing a social situation and responding to the bullshit around it, right? And so if you're like, oh my God, Liz is gonna go out of her mind with this, I am that person, right? And I will do a lot of my writing actually on Twitter as mm -hmm. figuring out a setup or a punchline or a joke, um, and then figuring out how to develop some stuff from there. I have a whole system where I write it. If I get 25 retweets in less than a minute, I favorite it, I put it in a document, um, and then I build. And I have a whole category of how I do it. So when I go out and you see me live, I am talking about the news probably of the past six weeks, M really the past okay. week. It is all fresh. And I open with, this is happening right now, and then I go and weave it all together. So, um, you know, that is, that is an interesting place for me. It's like, do I go into ramp mode? Do I just keep doing things? Um, you know, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, we are going to be launching um, a daily show that uh, is like a combination of kind of like, you know, some sketches and, and conversation and, and um, guests uh, that's going to be streamed on, uh, on a bunch of different platforms. We're not sure when we're going to launch it because COVID kind of kicked us in the ass about that. But, um, you know, 15 minute show that talks about all the news and reproductive rights because there's 140 stories a week about legislation that is coming down the pike or all around the country and people creating these sanctuary cities and moron incels who are saying shit. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So, 
you know, that's coming down the pike. So I think, um, how do we do it in a new way? It's like, these kind of things are a new way. Um, I wish I had stock in Zoom. Sad that I missed out on that trend, but you know, it's not. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a, and it's, and it's interesting because you're right, like this is whole new world and I feel like one of the things I love about writing and comedy is when this, we are now going more into what you're used to, right? Like you have written for television, you've done comedy, you've been a host on radio, like it, you're not used to there being, you're not used, you're not not used to there being a separation between you and the audience. Right. And kind of that reaction coming from more than just the laughter in front of your face. Um, are there any particular projects because of just having kind of this forced isolation that we're all in that you're working on or any kind of, or not working on? Have you just like been like, ah, it's on the shelf. I'll get back to it. It's cool. um, I mean, that this Operation Save Abortion show, we are tabling for the timing, but we have two super fun things um, coming up that I can tell you about. One is um, on Wednesday night, Hulu is launching Mrs. America, which mm -hmm. is a seven part series about the uh, men's rights activist, Phyllis Schlafly. I'm just calling her a men's rights activist because everything she did was to destroy women. and to keep find, find the lie. Yeah, I know, right? So um, we're gonna do the after show. We're gonna do an after show where we're gonna, um, every Friday night, it airs on Wednesdays and on Friday nights at 9 p.m. on the um, Abortion Access Force, it's AA Force, Twitter, Insta, IGTV, all of it. Um, we're going to have a three person conversation with a guest um, to talk about the episode. And then we're going to have an expert on who has talked about Schlafly, knows about Schlafly, has the tea on Schlafly. So that's going to be really fun. And so that launches on April 17th, which I'm super excited about. And then um, we are working on right now doing a gigantic um, adopt a clinic program. Um, and if you go to abortion, aafront.org. Um, you can find out how you can participate in helping fill the needs of clinics. Um, they need masks, they need gowns, they need gloves, they need everything that everybody needs. They also need lunch, they also need support. And so um, we're working on that. And then we have a super secret um, thing that we'll be announcing probably in a week and a half to do a big fundraiser for independent providers with a whole bunch of cool celebrities. Um, and so um, check the um, AA front I'll follow us on all the socials and um, you'll be able to see some of your favorite people doing wacky things um, and you can make donations and bid on cool stuff. And I'm excited to announce that. So that'll be coming up soon. I love that. That's, yeah. um, that's heck of productive. We're trying um, to be productive, but not too productive. You know, there's like yeah. check-in apps and people who are constantly like, do not try to change the world and take this time to reinvent shit. You don't have to learn how to play the cello. You don't have to like do everything, but do what you can do and just like tr try to make a difference and be good to yourself. A little bit of a difference and a lot of good to yourself. That's what I feel like. And, and make sure inside. you're <laughs> Let's please stay inside. Please stay inside. Um, <laughs> and, and make sure you're not eating 10 year old Worcestershire sauce. Please not I, mean, I think that's the best of it. That was the <laughs> best thing I found in my door. There's also other things like I'm unclear about the fact that like, if somebody gave me jam that they made homemade, but I never opened it and they canned it in 2010, is it still good? Cause it was, I don't never know. We should, let's, let's ask the audience audience. Uh, if you know anything about jam, uh, you know, anything about canning, can you let us know how long it's fresh? She's just never it. opened it. Never. never opened it. it. Yeah. Just want to know. I feel like you get, I don't, I don't know. I feel like we might have some seasons on that. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, for those of you who are watching, just know that you can uh, ask questions live by typing things into the comments, putting it into the chat box. Uh, we will be asking some of those questions live this afternoon. Um, it's not just a conversation between Liz and I, uh, but I, I think that's really interesting. Like this is like, again, back to this whole comment about everyday life is funny. Um, I, I'm also very worried about the fact that I left DC, I, I left uh, New York weeks ago and there was food in my fridge. So 50-50 chance 
I'm growing a science project right now. Ooh. Oh, no. oh, is anybody checking in on your spot? Yeah, no, no, no. Someone is constantly checking in on the spot. Uh, my housemates are constantly there. It's just I have a my own kitchen. Oh, yeah. It's gonna. You're gonna have. It's gonna be fun. There's gonna yeah. be some funky, yeah. some funky there. Yeah. yeah, and especially it is odd here um, in the city that used to. I used to pride myself on like loving the fact that it was just room service twenty four seven because you live in New York. Pick up the phone, call it up, whatever you want, and it's three weeks now to get anything delivered. So you do have to go to the store, and it that feels a little bit you know, scary to me. Just, I just feel like they have drummed into me that everyone around me is poison. That's what they drum into you. So now you're afraid of other humans, which I don't love, but also it's, you know, just have to be wise about things. Um, you know, and it's like my family sent me Clorox wipes because I couldn't get any in New York. So they sent them to me from Minnesota. Minnesota. So how are you, so for you, like, I know we kind of talked about writing is a little rough right now. Like there's just like a couple of things that just are kind of hard with the the overwhelming energy, like like you just mentioned. Yeah. How are you as an artist and, and as an activist kind of staying grounded in all of this? Because the East Coast is getting, is getting hit pretty hard. Yeah. Right now. You know, I, it's weird for me to be a person who has, I've been, selecting where I get information rather than d deep diving and reading a whole bunch of different things. I have really deconsumed, if that's a word. Um, it is now. Information in a way that I used to. I used to just be constantly, 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 what's every side saying? How am I going to make assessments? And I just had to not watch it all because I can't, I can't take it. So that's been a thing. And I'm also just diving into um nonsense um i'm diving into like shows that are fluffy and that don't require anything of me um i feel lucky that kathy valentine the great uh guitar player from the go-go's has a memoir that just came out i'm reading that it's great nice um, it's great because you know what nobody writes about a rock experience in in that that is constant if you can hear that is constant constant and that is new so it's literally picking people up constant. But um, it's the story of a woman's experience as a rock musician in the early 80s. And, you know, you hear so many rock stories through the lens of men. And it's great, you know. And, and so that's a really fun read. And I'm just, like, you know, doing what everyone else is doing, having chats, drinking with friends. Um, I think the thing that is the hardest for me is I work on – on these kind of platforms all day. So I'm talking to my staff and my team all day. Uh, and then it's also, I have to write things. And then I also am trying to socialize on this thing. And so mm -hmm. escaping this machine has been the toughest thing. And I do hit a wall. You know, how do I, where do I cut back? And I don't know the answer to that because I do want to have contact with people who are not just my coworkers. I want to be able to talk to you. And then I want to talk to my sister and I want to talk to my friends. And, you know, it's just like staring at this box. What are going to be the effects of that that we find out? Spending 12 hours a day staring on your computer. That's going to be a new thing where you discover is some kind of garbage thing for us. <laughs> oh, it's rewiring our brain as we're yeah. speaking right 100%. now. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting. I, I also want to know, so we both have a mutual love of music. Like yeah. an, I would call it an obsession. Um, you being from one of the greatest music cities in the yeah. entire country. Yeah. Um, you know, what are you listening to right now? I got to know. What am I listening to? Well, um, it's interesting. I discovered in, I started doing some organizational things. And I discovered two boxes of old cassette tapes and mixtapes. Um, and do you have a thing to play that on? No, I don't. But every Saturday on Facebook, I do a grab bag out, and I kind of just have conversations about that what this particular piece of music meant to me. And a lot of it I have on um, 
I, I'll get on iTunes. So it varies wildly. To, uh, I've been listening mostly. My go-to always is like 70s funk. Um, that's like my number one thing I go to when I don't know anything else to listen to. And so that can be anything from like uh, the Brothers Johnson to Ohio Players and Prince and Sly and Parliament, of course. And um, so I do a lot of that so I can just dance around in my apartment. Um, uh, and that's mostly what I'm listening to right now. And some jazz. And then like John Prine, I really felt like I really love John Prine. Like, so I have a really wide taste in music. Yeah. So the death of John Prine was really sad. It was really formative for me being the youngest of five kids in my family by a lot of years and yeah. not being allowed to touch the record player in our house. I was forced to listen to what my sisters would put on in their bedroom. And then I would sit outside their door. So the good news is, um, they had really good taste in music, which is why I know all about like early seventies funk and why, and then also John Prine and Joni Mitchell and like mm -hmm. all this other um, stuff that came up, David Bowie, like I lucked out. So um, I'm going back to a lot of nostalgia. How about you? What are you listening to? So right now I just, I just delved. So I got lucky. My sister had a record player. Uh, and so I've set up the record player and I ordered three specific vinyls. Uh, Jimmy Hendrix, the Hendrix experience, uh, Frank by Amy Winehouse, one of my favorite and the greatest one. and the greatest hits by Billie Holiday. have kind of been my, my go-tos, but if anybody knows me, I have a particular obsession for Prince, Harry Connick Jr. Ooh, I'm gonna um, go over to something. Are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. What? Are you ready? Okay. Now you can see my filthy apartment, but I'm gonna see how this works. So Prince is also, as you know, the oh. artist, my artist of all time. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You have well, a very I own special this. relationship to. I own that. Um, <gasps> If you can see what it is, it is from Prince's first photo shoot. It's from the photo shoot of the iconic picture of him in front of that wall of music symbols, Schmidt Music in Minneapolis. Remind and, me who took that picture. Um, it is a guy whose name is Robert. Um, I can't remember. Oh. Um, I have his book. I have the book. I love this. Yeah. I love so, this. Yeah. Ro it's his first uh, picture. And tell me if I'm showing you it well. Oh yeah, no, we are seeing all of it. That fro is beautiful. And there's a picture of him doing the peace sign, and there's a picture of him doing um, the finger, um, and that is that. And then next to it, I might as well just go down the line here, is Melvin Ray, who I love, um, jazz vocalist. Yes. And this is the last professional photograph that was ever taken of Mel Torme. I and then it. I have this cool one, and then I'll stop. And that is um, an outtake from Tom Waits closing time record it is one of the photographs that didn't get chosen. So oh. yeah. Oh. So a little bit of photos down the Liz Winstead photo wall. I love it. Well, and a lot of people don't understand like you're, you, if, correct me or wrong, you worked at First Ave, right? I worked at First Ave. I did for many years. Um, um, this is one of my, my favorite stories about you as a person and, and why I know that you are a true music fan is that I remember saying how much I loved Prince one time. We were out talking about probably many other things. I was like, he was like, you named how many times you had seen him perform and I literally almost died. Yeah, yeah. I saw him 12 times at First Avenue alone and then twice in, um, or three times I think in larger venues. Like, so, yeah, I saw him open for the Rolling Stones. So, you know, there's a big, huge story about that particular tour is that when he first had gone on that tour, this is back when he was still half naked, right? Uh, so I remember reading this incredible story about how he had been booed. Like, and to, to imagine Prince being booed on anything is insane. So he'd been booed. He got booed all the way back to Minneapolis, though. Mm-hmm. And he goes home, and I'm sure you know the story. He goes home, he gets coaxed back on tour, and he finishes, but it was his first, like, rude awake, because in his head, everything he was doing, he had perfected. No one was ready for Minneapolis at that point. No one, no one. Really Minneapolis understood. Was doing 
Yeah, and so the cool thing, my coolest Prince story is that I was one of the lucky people. Prince did a um, benefit for the ballet company in at First Avenue. Uh, and it was August 3rd, 1983. And it was during the 1999 tour. And I was working at First Avenue. And um, it was, I would say, I don't know. It was, it was hot. But it was... It was great. I couldn't believe it. I was on the guest list. Somebody sent me the guest list, which is great. There's a picture of the guest list. Um, and it was the night that he premiered five songs from Purple Rain that no one had heard. And he opened up the show with the song Purple Rain. And let me tell you, there's footage of it. Somebody tried to make a documentary. Um, and I don't know what is happening with the documentary, but yeah. I was in the documentary. They interviewed me for it. And um, they sent me some clips and they sent me um, two clips that were amazing. The first one was Purple Rain um, mm -hmm. into DMSR. Um, and he did, you're watching people A, with no phones, right? And watching people who didn't know the song Purple Rain. Like it's surreal to watch the footage and to watch people staring. And you know, Purple Rain's got that like, Four oh, yeah. long open right at the beginning, that just guitar open. So everyone's just staring like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then watching them watch it was incredible. He also did solo Joni Mitchell's A Case of You. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. And um, yeah, it was wild. Yeah, I've heard, was, I've heard the bootleg of a recording of him doing that song. Yeah, but, it yeah. is amazing. It is incredible. And so it was, you know, and then having him do those like closed secret shows at the club, you know, he'd show up at 11. They wouldn't let anybody else in the club and he would either have a band or he would just do solo acoustic or whatever. It was great. I totally lucked out. I am of that age. I'm 58 and I'm of that age where this window of such dope musicians were coming of age and yeah. playing in small venues and being growing up in a music town, they all came to Minneapolis. And so it was really great. And a lot of them live there. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, the, and that's just, I mean, I think that's just so interesting when you think about now and you think about this moment and being grounded and how creatives are creating because so much happens kind of what you were talking about again in these spaces of 500 and these spaces of 100 and these groups of collaboration and and how um, this shifting has been happening. I, I gotta ask, cause I've been asking kind of everybody this question and also remind everybody, you can ask questions live by putting questions in the comment box or the chat box, or you may just want Liz to talk more about Prince. Who doesn't want that? Um, but honestly, where for, for everyone, because I know everyone's trying to find their little space of joy because you, you kind of have to have it amidst all of the hard news, particularly this week that is happening and all of the things that are are going to continue to happen until this starts to recede a little bit. How are you finding joy right now as a, as a creative, but also just, just as a person? Yeah. Um... You know, it's really hard. I I find joy from the people. I mean, I work with really joyful people and I feel really lucky about that. The contact with people um, via Zoom is, is, a, is a really good place for where I'm getting my joy. Um, I think, in fact, as we talk, I'm just looking at text just came in of my sister sending me pictures of her grandbaby, um, who's adorable. Um, I think sharing, you know, it's little things. I find that I can't, like normally I would say, oh, reading. And I'm not able to focus that hard on reading. Like I'm reading Kathy's book and that's all, and that's the book I can read, right? Like mm -hmm. taking in dancing and music and dancing around my apartment and trying to go outside um, and take walks is really where it's at. Online Scrabble is also helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much, and also looking through old photographs and memories. I have a lot of friends who are doing the same thing where it's like sharing times that we were together and um, really having, um, having those kind of moments. And it really resonates with me that, um, and I hope we all 
take a pause to realize that um, if this feels scary for you and if this feels um, like you're alone and you feel trapped and those things are happening, um, that is how our, our older population lives, you know? And so living mm -hmm. with those memories and having those memories is, is what older folks look at. And so if you're feeling loneliness, um, hopefully it's a reminder to reach out to a lot of those folks who are, uh, for, for whom without COVID, that's even the reality, you know, taking a step and remembering that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that is an exclamation point on that statement. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's hard for everybody to figure out where joy is. I think joy, um, I've never felt like I don't know the future before. And I feel that. And I feel like, and, and what I mean by that is not like doomsday, but um, in even trying to figure out what the new, what the new way is that we're going to be living, how we're going to gradually transition back to a normal that is uncertain. How do you make plans for that? Um, and I don't, I don't know what the answer is. And I guess it's trying to create things in now that bring me joy. Like I'm really excited to watch this Hulu show about Phyllis Schlafly and have conversations about it after and connect that way. I mean, that feels, that feels normal to me. Like that feels like a good normal. So um, I don't know. It's all such a mystery. I'm trying to think about things like um, there's no way uh, in the world we could have asked people to stay indoors and not drive in their cars and turn their factories off because the climate is in crisis. And now with us being such less consumers and such less toxic um, um, inhabitants of the earth, um, will that decelerate some of the urgency around climate? And can we adapt some of these lesser consumeristic behaviors to save the planet when we are back out in the world? Can we ride our bikes more? Will we walk more? Will we consume less? You know, will we ask ourselves to do that if we really see a change in our behaviors, um, move a change in how our planet is warming? You know, if this could be a healing process for our planet, wouldn't that be something? I don't know. So I'm trying to look at that as something that we can also latch onto as a positive. I love it. No, and I think everyone's got something different, right? And that's yeah. the beauty of it. Uh, for folks who want to follow you, Liz Ooh. Winstead, uh, and all of the many things that you were doing, all the things can, you I'm us, doing. can you let us know where you're on the interwebs? Well, I personally am on all the interwebs at Liz Winstead. You see how my name is spelled right there? You just put an at in front of it and you got it. Um, but if you want to follow my organizations, um, we are super fun. We are super provocative, super edgy. So it's a good place to see humor and rage intersecting in a way that's really positive and that's at abort at access force and at access front so those two places are great um and you can see the goings on and the doings and have some fun and feel like you're part of a community i love it well tomorrow please stay tuned for our friday show where our conversation we're gonna be doing it aaron lafleur so uh aaron leffler and i will say it correct aaron i love you so much aaron leffler who actually is the artist who created our amazing logo that you oh, see right. in that corner um, but Erin is also a uh, merchandiser, character developer. She works for uh, works with Lucasfilm. She works with Marvel. An extremely talented human being uh, that does a lot of positive stuff. Uh, did an incredible piece where uh, Princess Leia is hugging healthcare workers with the word hope over it and is selling it to raise money to actually help out to give back to healthcare workers and medical professionals right now. And so she'll be on tomorrow. Kind of talking about what is it what does it mean to be a visual artist right now and how that's adapted adapted and adjusted. Uh, but I want to say thank you again so much, Liz, for taking the time out today. To you, and if this is the way that we can like communicate and with other people, I'm so happy to be here. Um, please be well, and um, let me know when you're back in New York. Yes. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Bye. <sighs>